the only way I can describe it is like when you go into those places and you have those experiences, mm -hmm. you realize like none of this other stuff is really what we think it is. You speak to thousands of people, but you walk back to your hotel room alone. And that duality is like, it's like, it's disorienting. You're like, who am I? What am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing this stuff? So today I have Mike Kim. What do you call yourself? A branding expert? Or? I just, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, your official like thing. But he's pretty much the young next door. It's someone I, <laughs> you like that? No. No, no. Well, okay, yeah, whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. No, but um, really, Mike, I, I look up to you so much. Uh, I found your podcast when I was like going through a major breakup in my life. And I was like, man, I just need some order in my life. But it's like all these white dudes. <laughs> like, <laughs> No offense. No offense. Most of my friends are Caucasian. No so, racial. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, like it was just really inspiring to just see another Asian out there just kind of doing this. And, you know, something I've always struggled with was like branding, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. And so it's so great to just have you here on today and I appreciate you just coming out. Well, no, thanks for, thanks for all those kind words. Um, I don't think I ever had a vision to like, kind of like do stuff like that or like be an inspiration to people. I was just like, I'm going to share my life. I'm going to share what I know, try to add value to people. Mm -hmm. And I've heard things like that over the years. And I learned really early on, like not to really read and believe your own press clippings because mm. it can kind of like delude you into this sense of like being self-important. Mm -hmm. um, being in branding and being in the particular kind of branding that I'm in, working with people who are branding themselves and their ideas, you tend to meet a lot of folks who are self-important. Mm -hmm. And self-important people are really interesting in that mm -hmm. there's like this sense of entitlement and, you know, yeah, a little hint of narcissism. <laughs> it's, it's really just a disguise to cover up their insecurity. Yeah. And I think I've always held a little bit loosely to the roles that defined me. Yeah. which has allowed me to kind of change a lot of things and what I do in my life. And I'm still discovering who I am. I don't think you ever get to that point. Well, not that I know of, Yeah. right? At least now, maybe when I'm like 60, 70, 80, who knows? <laughs> I just stopped giving a <laughs> right? About anything, right? And which I admire with people that age. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. And, and that means a lot, honestly, that means a lot. You know, it's really refreshing what you just said. You're like, man, Sometimes I don't even know what the f I'm doing. Right? I don't, I don't, I really don't. <laughs> but I guess like, how did you develop this? Because outside looking in, you have your f together. You look very well put together. When I first met you, I was like, man, I don't know if I can be like super ratchet with Mike. If he's like super <laughs> professional. But as I got to know you, we started talking about psychedelics and all that. That's a cool, the cool Mike I like. Right. But how did you like build this like identity or perceived identity as a branding expert. You know, it's funny you say that because most of the people who, t who like give me feedback on the content I create, they're like, you're super authentic. You're super real. Hmm. And there's almost nothing I won't talk about. I mean, there's very little I won't talk about. Hmm. Like come to think of it, I don't think there's anything I wouldn't talk about. What's your social security number? I mean, yeah, I <laughs> yeah. mean, I can, no comment. Um, but I don't have one, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I feel like that has been one of my superpowers. Hmm. A friend of mine said to me, and he is like a multiple time best-selling author, his name's Jeff Goins. Hmm. And when I first met Jeff, he was way ahead in the game. Like he was writing books. He was like, and we're still tight to this day. Yeah. And I was just like, I'll never get to where this dude is. Like he's just killing it. And um, he goes, you know what your superpowers are? You make difficult things simple mm. and you're vulnerable. I used to think it was marketing and branding or whatever, whatever you know, whatever. And the more I thought about that word vulnerability, yeah. Your relationships go only as deep as your willingness to be vulnerable mm. with the people around you. And I think I've done that a little bit better than most people think. Now, I think there's another layer in it. You know, I'm halfway done with this drink. <laughs> like, who knows what the heck's gonna happen while we're on this. But um, I've just kind of always worn my own stuff on my sleeve mm. when appropriate. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's kind of it. So it's interesting that you say that, Yeah. but from the feedback that I get, most people are like, dude, you write blog posts about your divorce or you write a you know, funny shit about like dating. And like, I would post stuff on Instagram stories. And like, they, they, those are absolutely the most engaged pieces. Like 
you know, like over the years. Right. Yeah. And so, and I don't do it as a publicity stunt. Yeah. I'm just like, whatever. Like this is what's going on in my life. Like, why do I have to hide anything? Yeah. So yeah. Dude, it's so crazy because like, I didn't know you had so many like crazy stories and stuff, <laughs> right? Like you have crazy stories and you're always like making me laugh. And even when we were like going out to Korean barbecue, you're talking about stories. You're like, dude, my dog wouldn't even eat this. Like I'll, I'll post a clip about that later. But it's just so interesting. And so like, you know, one of the things I think about is like, how do you go about like collecting these stories and all that as well? I think I'm, I just like to document things. I've always done things that way. Mm -hmm. There's an element where you have to create, like you have to go in and edit. You mm -hmm. have to go in and do post-production. I, I grew up doing music and there's a piece where you have to sanitize, mm -hmm. clean up for the sake of the audience so that it's more digestible and palatable to them, right? Mm. Like if I were to use a cooking analogy, and I really like cooking. Really? Most people don't know this. Hmm. I love knowing what ingredients I'm prepping. I love knowing how much of everything gets into the dish. Okay. And then the final product has very little resemblance to what you started out with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I've always loved that messiness. Yeah. And then with social media, my life became that messiness. Yeah. And so if anything, I feel it's like this. I might not share with you a picture of the chicken francais that I make. <laughs> I'll post a picture about the lemon I cut up in the, in the filet, the chicken filet that I just <laughs> like cut in half and people are like, Oh, that's very vulnerable. That's very real. Yeah. But we can all buy chicken at the store for 20 bucks a pack. Yeah. Right. So if anything, that's kind of how I approach it. Mm. And I've never bothered to learn the, the skills on video mm. to clean up the stuff. Yeah. I can do it with writing, but I've never learned it on video and YouTube and Instagram, and all these other visual platforms. So I think there's still a rawness to it, if you will. Yeah. You're talking about, you're speaking about making stories or um, your experiences more digestible. Are there a few elements that you could kind of break that down into a digestible story? Yeah, I think what I think through, like the marketing brain in me, the marketing answer I give everybody is never tell a story without making a point and never make a point without telling a story. Now that sounds like good advice, but I don't think like that. Mm -hmm on an everyday basis. I just think like, what are some of the relevant salient moments from my day yeah. that I can share? So not many people know this. I don't keep Instagram on my phone. Mm, that's something I learned. I upload, I download it multiple times mm. a day, depending on the situation. If I'm traveling like this, we're in Vegas. Yeah. I know that I'm gonna be just out and about. I keep it on my phone. But when I'm at home, I don't have Instagram on my phone. So what I do is during the course of the day, I will whip out the camera, take pictures, take video. Mm. And if I feel so inclined that night, I'll redownload Instagram. I'll post all the stories, <laughs> all the captions, and then I'll delete Instagram again. And wow. I'll look at it till the next day. Yeah. And to me, social media is a drug. Mm. It's a drug. Like the way that it's wired, the way that it's built. If you've ever just looked at Instagram on your laptop, yeah. You're on it for like 10 seconds and you peace out. It's the, com and how appropriate we're in Vegas. It's the combination <laughs> of your phone and the app, which is like literally a slot machine. You pull it down. You're like, what's it got for me today? Yeah. Right. So I've learned to kind of cut that off and not to be like crude with examples, but please, please be <laughs> as crude as you want. <laughs> it's like, you know, the most successful drug dealers, they never get high on their own supply. Yeah. And to me, I'm just like, Instagram's a drug. Yeah. I have to use it. It's where people hang out. Mm -hmm. It's a place that I can use for good, mm -hmm. but I will not let it dominate my thought life. How many times have we all woken up in the morning? The first thing you do is check your texts and Instagram, and you are listening to what some algorithm is telling you you should pay attention to. Yeah. And it's exhausting. So that's kind of how I do it. I just document throughout the day. Sometimes I just like any videographer, good videographer, I take a lot more content in than I do anything with. And it's amazing. Cause at the end of the day, I'm like, Oh, I thought that was going to be something I would post, but I don't. Yeah. It's not relevant. Yeah. It's not relevant to the story. So it's sort of intuitive for me. I want it to be like chronological. I want it to tell, you know, a story of my day, yeah. if you will. But that's really how I approach it. Yeah. Like your stories are so interesting too. Like I think you're a master, like, 
like dude we were talking about like your psychedelic experiences like your dating experiences what do you think like what is a good structure for a story do you follow a structure or do you just like whatever like i don't really i i think it's more like the aspects of my personality so i'm sarcastic mm -hmm. with myself not with other people because mm. people who are sarcastic with other people are kind of like a-holes right yeah. i mean they yeah. come across like that i'm self-deprecating yeah in certain ways but i also know what i'm good at so like one of the things that i always talk to people about when i coach them or like teach them marketing and branding is that there are three three postures that you can share your content from mm -hmm. the first is you're a struggler you know and you can just say hey I'm, I'm trying to lose weight and i'm trying to you know make money or i'm trying to find a new job or i'm trying to get my you know romantic life right yeah and you're not acting like you've got it all figured out and the second level up is a sherpa which is basically a guide right a tour guide right and this is someone who's been on the path up and down and they know how to take you up there and guide other people and then you come back down. And the third is a sage, mm -hmm. like they've got it figured out. They know what they're doing. So in all of our lives, there are, we can, we can like kind of step into any one of those three roles. So maybe in marketing and branding, yeah, people may think I'm a sage. Yeah. Like they're like, you know, this guy knows, knows what he's doing. He's been doing it for years. Um, he's got the credentials. A Sherpa might be, I might be like along the lines of just building a business, mm. right? Um, getting things in order, growing a business and all that stuff. But dude, I do not have any business starting a channel about working out or nutrition as you can see. <laughs> okay. And if I'm just trying to get more in shape and work out regularly yeah. and all that, I'm going to be like, dude, I'm going in and we're going to, my trainer said, we're going to do deadlifts and squats today. Oh God, this is going to be <laughs> hell. Right. And, and that's what's authentic to people. It's just understanding those three levels mm. from which you can share on something. I know a lot of people who are really good at making money and, and great at real estate or whatever, investing, whatever it is. When it comes to their relationships, they're completely novices. And I've seen it the other way around where people are like great family life, great, you know, partner. They've got that thing. It's almost like they're the, the wisest people in the world. But when it comes to their money, they're struggling. <laughs> they can't figure that thing out. Right. Yeah. So we're all human and none of us are a sage in everything. Mm -hmm. And I just try to be authentic about like what position I share it from. That's so interesting because, um, man, I think one of the things I, I just realized because you've been um, letting me tag along, shoot some BTS for uh, David Meltzer's event. And I was like, dude, like all these people are just like us, you know, and that's one of the realizations. And you're talking about like humanizing as well. Like I thought that was very, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, he, people are people. There was this, there was this guy um, I met on this trip, um, mm -hmm. Larry Hagner, Dad Edge podcast. I'd never heard of him. Twenty Super million cool. plus downloads. Super cool. I'm not a dad, so why would I listen to a show? <laughs> At least that I know of. I don't think I'm a dad that I know of. <laughs> and he brought his 16 year old son Ethan out. Yeah. And Larry asks me, "Hey, what what's one piece of advice you'd give you'd give to uh, my 16 year old son? Could you share that?" And that that was really cool. Mm. And then he asked Ethan to ask me a question mm -hmm. and Ethan goes to me, he goes like, what, what's it like? Like, what have you learned being around so many of these successful people in your career? And I was like, dude, that's a really good question for a 16 year old. And I said to him, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's just a person. Mm. The more successful people become, the more other people want something from them. So it's sometimes hard for them to know who their real friends are. Yeah. But at the end of the day, everyone's just a person. Mm. and deep inside like i think the name of the game is just learning to love yourself because that's who you have to spend the rest of your life with yeah. i mean i can never escape myself yeah. no matter how much i try right and so at some point you have to come to terms with who you are mm. and who you see in the mirror and and that's really been the name of the game with me um life is messy it's ups and downs all the time yeah i've never met a single person who's just had a super easy life the whole way yeah and um i just share it from that perspective of a struggler <laughs> and in certain things you know a sherpa and in business stuff yeah i might have some but who, no one really cares about <laughs> what i know about marketing and branding you know they that i hope to god i do not be remembered like that when i die dude you i know? love your like I love your like b BTS behind the scenes. I love the personality of Mike and seeing like you in real life. I love those stories and stuff too. It's pretty funny. And um, speaking about humanizing, like what? So for me, sometimes 
like when I'm talking to like people who I perceive like way more successful than me, I get freaking nervous. I'm like, dude, I'm an extrovert too. I love mm-hmm. talking to people all the time. But did you, did you ever go through that phase? And you're talking about also the process of self love as you're talking to more successful people. Like if, if you did get nervous, did it kind of like, I don't know what the good, a good question is, but to kind of like taper off over time. No, I still get nervous. I really? still get, yeah, I get nervous like everybody else. Yeah, I do. It's, it's just like a raging, I'm like a duck yeah. on the lake. It's like, it looks calm <laughs> on the outside and underneath it's just like a raging or, or a swan or whatever, yeah. whichever bird does that. Um, but I think the difference is that I've always been able to, or maybe I've stepped into the ability mm. to take that discomfort Mm. and use it as a tool for self-reflection. So I might see someone who's got things seemingly more figured out than I do. Mm -hmm. And then I'll use that discomfort to ask myself, what do you think that they've done? Or what do you think they've had to fight for Mm -hmm. to get to that level of peace or confidence or contentment? Mm. Not jealous or not that I'm you know, kind of just upset or Mm. frustrated at myself. Even when I get frustrated with myself, I ask myself, why are you frustrated at yourself? Mm. What are you not learning? What do you need to learn? What do you need to grow in? What is the price that you have to pay? What's the thing that you have to confront? What's the fear? What's the anxiety? Mm. What are the patterns? That's not to say that the people who have made a lot of money or have a lot of status or have a lot of fame have done something necessarily better than others. Yeah. Dude, I could have invested in crypto like 20 years ago. And just <laughs> Like, okay, all right, I'd add like good gajillion dollars. That doesn't mean I grew as a person. Yeah. So I, I, I try to eventually ask myself the right questions, the deeper questions on it coming back to me and what do I need to learn? Mm-hmm. What do I need to grow in? And maybe that works itself out and manifests itself in more tangible things like, the money you make or the impact you have and all that sort of stuff. But Mm -hmm. for me, mostly it's just been looking at the guy in the mirror, trying to figure out who he is, why he does the things he does, um, the way he does. And, and that's it. I just, I really try hard not to run other people's races. I just try to run my own race. What do you do when you find yourself like running other people's races? Do you go through that reflection period or? Yeah, so there's a couple of tools that I've had to kind of learn and put into my toolbox, right? Yeah. Uh, there are some people like, if all you have in your toolbox is a hammer, you're gonna treat everything like it's a nail. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you gotta learn some nuance, you've gotta learn some new tricks. Some of it's physiological, mm. like getting the right amount of sleep. I do cold showers every morning. I've really? done that for two years straight. I thought it was ridiculous. I didn't understand why people did this. I don't even know how I started. I think someone told me they did it and I just started playing around with it. I watched some YouTube videos on it. Um, And coincidentally, of course, just this past week, I got to interview Wim Hof, who's like the leader in moving, you know, this, this whole concept forward. And I can't start my day without it now. Yeah. Because it clears all the juju and the bad energy. Um, I'm pretty sure my neighbors think I'm crazy. (laughs) <laughs> my friends who have stayed over my place, they hear me take, I'm, I'm just screaming obscenities. They're like, what are you doing, dude? Um, the importance of working out, exercise, eating right, you know, even cutting down on this stuff. Like mm. I know the marked difference in my life when I practice those things. Mm. Having a gratitude practice, another tool that's been really important is this thing called the five minute journal. Oh yes, I have. That. I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world when I, when I started out. You write three things you're grateful for, or three things that would make today great, and a daily affirmation. I'm like, give me a break. But I've done this almost two years straight, yeah. nearly every day. Yeah. When I miss a day, I usually go back and fill in what I missed. And when I look through that journal and I look at my life over the course of six months, because if you fill it out every day, it's like six months, mm-hmm. you realize that the things that other people think are big are very small. Mm. And the things that you think are small are very big. So case in point, July, what, 2022? I think it was 2020, no, 2021. Mm-hmm. I've released my first book. I remember. You are the brand. It hits two bestseller lists. And you know how much space that took up in my gratitude journal? It was one line out of three that day. Hmm. And probably that day, it was three great things that happened today. My book hit two bestseller lists. Yeah. I got my workout in. 
<laughs> and I did not drink. Yeah. It trivialized the the thing that most people not trivialized, but it put it in perspective. Mm. And when I look back at the journal, the thing I realized that makes me the most happy and the most common thing that I said I was most grateful for or what made the day great was that I showed up well for work mm. and that I got my work out in and that I was grateful for my apartment, mm. right? I was grateful to spend time with family and friends, even my friends' kids. I started to see that. Yeah. And that was so much more important. I'm only gonna write a book once every couple of years, yeah. if that. Yeah. So why build my whole identity and my well-being around it? It's the little things that I do every day that are actually big. You know what's so interesting? Because I have the same journal. I had this journal since uh, I followed Tim Ferriss a long time ago. And he always recommended it. And you know what's so funny? Like, being an Asian household, they're like, dude, we're never f***ing grateful for anything. Yep. They're always yelling at you for s***. And, like, when I started doing it, I was, like, really, really struggling. But over time, what I found personally was, like, I noticed that I was more grateful for the people around me, like for specific people. And it would go even one step further after I fill out all this st sort of stuff. Like maybe I'm really grateful that I'm doing a podcast with Mike today. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll feel it. And then I'll probably like send you a voice message and be like, yo, Mike. It'll be super sappy. And yeah, we'll be yeah. like, no, dude, this is cool. Yeah. You got to get in the feels. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah. And I, I, I think gratitude is one of the most, important tools that like to shift us out of that survival state i've never been like grateful and pissed off at the same time ever mm. in my life right so it's totally a skill like thanksgiving used to come around mm -hmm. and it's almost like you're obligated to be thankful and our our skill at expressing and identifying gratitude is so poor mm -hmm. what do you say oh, i'm glad i'm alive i'm glad for my family even though i don't love them. like i don't like all of them right yeah and that is such low level expression. It reminds me of the first time I went into counseling <laughs> and um, my counselor was like, my therapist was like, tell me what you're feeling. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm upset. Like, yeah, but what are you feeling? I was like, I just said, I'm upset. Mm. Dude, Kevin, I literally, the next time I went in, I literally had to Google words for emotions. Yeah. And this is when I was going through like marital problems, right? Yeah. And I was like, there they there was literally a color wheel on Google. <laughs> Dude, I had I to do the same you thing. Not. Rage, fury, yeah. right? Angst. And then it goes like from red to like orange. Yeah. Right? Like agitation, frustration, right? And then yellow is like annoyance or disappointment. And I'm like and I felt like a freaking second grader. I'm like whipping out this color wheel in front of our therapist. I'm like I feel this rage <laughs> and this agitation. And I'm like, I'm like 40 years old at the time. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Yeah. But we don't deal with that stuff until it's almost too late. Mm. And yeah, man, I mean, I think about my life and I think about life in general. Yeah. And I just, I say this to everybody nowadays, you know, life's short, but it's the longest thing you ever do. Mm. Eat good food, spend more time with loved ones, never pass up an adventure. Yeah. Like, I know I'm not going to take any of this with me. Yeah. Right. And so, and I'm of that age where like very prominent people who are my age or younger have died. Kobe Bryant and I were the same age. Chadwick Boseman, Black Panther, died. He's like a year, we're like a year apart. Yeah. And it's like when those guys died, it was very jarring for me. Yeah. I've now lived four years longer, I think, three or four years longer than Kobe Bryant. That's outrageous. That's that's wild. And people still remember him, but will they in 10 years? Will they, the Steve Jobs died, what, 2010? Yeah. And I'm in this industry where people talk about, I'm gonna change the world, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an impact. Dude, Steve Jobs changed the world like nobody, I mean, we all still have his phone, Yeah. right? I don't know how many people, especially the younger generation of people who use an iPhone, mm -hmm. even know who Steve Jobs is. Yeah. For about two years, Steve Jobs was quoted in like every business keynote speech that I, I remember saw. remember that. I remember and then he that. just dropped the F off the cliff, right? Like just pe people have forgotten him. It's like 12, 13 years later. He's just forgotten, right? So we, we like set, tend to put these concepts of like legacy and impact on a pedestal. Yeah. As if people are going to remember us, they're not going to remember you. Mm. They might deal with the effects or uh, 
ramifications or consequences of what you did. Yeah. But outside of having kids, a family, like I'm not sure that, yeah, we can make a difference in people's lives, mm. but that's probably where I see it the most, you know, in the lives of family. Right. Yeah. But that's what's also helped keep me in check. Like, all right, I wrote a book. If someone tells me like it changed your life. Cool. Yeah. I'm like, amazing. That's cool. That's not why I wrote it. Mm. I'm glad it helped you. I, as long as I'm alive, I'll do what I can. If you ask me to help you, but I don't have these delusions of grandeur, like in a hundred years, people are going to remember my name, mm. you know? So I, dude, I don't even know. I literally don't know my grandmother's name. Really? I don't know her name. She's harmony in Korean, right? Yeah. I don't know her name. That's my paternal grandmother. All right. <laughs> like I was closer to her. Yeah. I definitely do not know my maternal grandfather and grandmother's name. They passed when I was a kid. I literally don't know their names. Gun to my head. I'd be like, is their last name Lee? Because my mom's last name is Lee. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be it, right? Do I get half credit? That's two generations. And I don't know my grandparents' name. So like, and that's, that's 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Now people's attention span is even smaller. Social media, the internet, everything. We're going to be forgotten, you know? So I don't, I don't have delusions of grandeur around that stuff. Such a great reminder of like impermanence and all that. And like, I don't know. I was guilty of it too. Like when I was a lot younger, I was like, yeah, I want to leave a legacy. I want to change the world. But it's so interesting. You brought up the grandma and grandfather analogy. I'm like, I know it on my mom, my dad's side, but my mom's side, I don't even freaking know, dude. I don't know. It's don't crazy. Know. Don't know. My aunt just passed away a couple months. Well, I had two aunts pass away in the past uh, past year. Mm. I literally don't know their names. Holy crap. I literally do not know their names. And my oldest cousin, you know, we see each other every couple of years here and there. And mm. we have a good relationship. Yeah. And it was her mom. Yeah. I don't know her name. I don't know her mom's name. Yeah. Um, that's on my paternal side maternal side one of my aunts passed away my mom flew to korea about a year and a half ago yeah i don't i don't know her name i don't know i had a hard time remembering who she was she's apparently sang at my wedding really i don't remember i just remember her singing at my wedding but i don't know her name i'm just like that's emo aunt in korean yeah and so this whole thing about impermanence and like all we have is right now like it's a miracle we're alive it's a miracle that we're here I could be anywhere else. You could be anywhere else. We're just sitting here in Vegas, like in this hotel. Like what are the odds billion to none billion to one that you and I would sort of cross paths, find each other on the freaking internet. And I'd be in Vegas and you happen to live here. It's crazy. It's wild. It yeah. Blows that, my mind. That's the real yeah. miracle to me. Like, yeah, it really blows my mind. Sometimes those like instances but did you did you always have this like were you always like this in terms of impermanence like you always kind of knew as a child is that what your parents taught you or did you kind of learn it over time i think it was just always wired in me i was like what's the point I, i've always asked mm. what's the point which was why i did so poorly in school <laughs> <laughs> especially math okay um i hated math i hated practicing you know questions and all this kind of stuff and when I was in 10th grade, we yeah. finished 10th grade. My buddy Steve, okay, Steve Kang. I haven't seen him for probably almost a <laughs> decade and a half. Um, he goes, hey, let's take summer school together. Yeah. And I thought that meant let's get our crap together because, like, I was bad at math. So I go to summer school with him. My mom's like, oh, my God, you want to go to summer school? Unbelievable. What's, are you on drugs? <laughs> like, this is amazing, right? And so I'm like, no, you know what? I actually should go to summer school because I have no idea what I'm doing in math class. Yeah. We take the summer course. It was actually trigonometry. So I skipped a math class by taking it in seventh grade. So when I got to 11th, uh, 10th grade, so when I got to 11th grade, I took pre-calc. I was totally unprepared. I just bombed. <laughs> and 12th grade, they put me in calculus. Dude, I didn't, I legit did not have a freaking clue what I was doing <laughs> in that class. So I skipped a math class by accident. Yeah. Right. And I think about that and I'm just like, I was always like, why does this matter? Mm. Why does calculus matter? As far as I can tell, calculus 
is used to figure out exactly how much ketchup in the McDonald's pump <laughs> comes out when you squeeze it down. That's literally, I remember saying that in 12th grade. And my mom was like, you're getting D's. You're getting F's in calculus. I was like, I don't get what the point is. Yeah. What's the point? I've always been like that. So if there's a point, if I can see it, mm. I'm good. If it's mm. hard, it's okay. Mm. I don't need it to be easy. I just need it to be worth it. Mm. I need to understand why we're doing it. And there's so much stuff that we go through in life. But we never think about what's the point. Mm. That's so interesting because like, you know, I, you've publicly said on your podcast that you do psychedelics and stuff like that. So what was that transition like? What was the point of like doing psychedelics or Aya like experience? If you're open to talking about yeah, it. I've never done Aya. Okay. I've done a couple of psilocybin journeys, which are basically mushrooms. Okay. And uh, the first one I went on was about three years ago. So like 2020, mm -hmm. 2020, 2021 around there. Yeah. 20. Yeah. No, actually be 2019 because mm -hmm. it was before COVID. Okay. And I just gotten divorced like six, seven months earlier, nine months earlier, mm -hmm. you know, late 2018. And my friend Trevinia, shout out to Triv, um, she goes to me, I don't like who you're becoming because I was just drinking a lot and just horsing around, like just doing crazy <laughs> crap, right? I was raging like a college student, I was just <laughs> going nuts. And she's like, I don't like who you're becoming. Yeah. I want you to come to this retreat with me. I was like, no way. I don't do drugs. I've never done them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. We run into each other in LA. I happen to be there for some other thing and she's there for another thing for business. We go out to dinner. It's been a little bit since I've seen her and we get in the, I distinctly remember this conversation. I took her to some Korean place in LA because of course, right? Because Triv's like the whitest girl you always see, right? White and black. <laughs> And I go, I remember saying to her something along the lines of like, what is wrong with you? Why are you talking so much? And why are you so happy? You asked her that. Yeah. Cause she'd always has an et, had an edge. She was like me. We're like, we're like the same number on the Enneagram. We're both eights. <laughs> we just had this edge. And she tells me, you know, Chris and I, her husband mm -hmm. been going to this, doing, doing these seminars. We've been doing this work. That's what sold me. Mm. I still went kicking and screaming. Yeah. They didn't tell me what I was going to do. They didn't tell me what to expect. It was very scary for somebody like me because I'm like, I want to be in control. I want to kind of understand what's going on. Yeah. I go on, I go out there and it's like one of the most transformative experiences of my entire life. Mm. Um, I don't remember all of it. Yeah. But Trevinia and Chris were watching me. They did not participate. They were facilitating with the people who hosted the retreat. And um, I do remember like falling into the medicine, like felt like I was spinning backwards, like into space. Yeah. And then I remember like turning on my side into the fetal position because that's how I sleep. And I remember like feeling and seeing all this blackness, like there was this tar inside my heart. Yeah. I don't remember this, I, but I screamed out like my dad. I screamed about my ex-wife, like, you know, her name. I, I screamed it out. Yeah. And... The, she told me after I woke up, like they, the facilitator was like, who is that? And she said, that's his ex-wife. And everyone just started crying. Cause I guess there was just that much pain. Oh, wow. I don't remember saying that. Yeah. But I said it cause it's all on tape. Right. <laughs> oh, and, um, and I remember seeing this feminine figure made of light mm -hmm. and I saw the contour of her shape, her body. Yeah. And it was like this teal and blue light shining from the back. And so I could see the contour of this female form. Yeah. And I said, no provocation. I was like, oh, I know who you are. I was like, you're the divine feminine, aren't you? Dude, I don't know where the frick. I don't say words like that. <laughs> Dude, I would yeah. never expect yeah. you to say something like that. I'm like, like you're the divine feminine, aren't you? And she didn't say anything. She just stood there and I said, thank you. Every woman I've met, my sister, my mom, all my friends, even my ex-wife, even my mother-in-law, who like I was just mad with at the time, yeah. came from you. They're just an expression of you. And um, it changed me because I was just like screwing around. I was just sleeping around. I was, <laughs> I was just in full rage mode. Yeah. Right. I was angry. I was hurt. And I would have told you, dude, if you, I met you back then, you were like, you're angry and you're hurt. I'm like, no, I'm fine. 
I'm fine. Mm. Right. But that's really where it came from. Absolutely transformative experience. Um, and you have to do the work after it. It doesn't, it's not a, it's not a magic wand. Like you've got to integrate it. You've got to do something with that awareness. And in fact, if you become aware of it and you don't do anything with it, you actually dig yourself into a deeper hole because you find another level of awareness and more BS you can say to people like, oh yeah, I know I've, I've been through that. I know it. And it's like, but you don't really implement it. Yeah. You can just dig yourself in a deeper hole. So yeah, that's what that experience was like. So I wait, how do you more act- experiences? Yeah. How do you actually like, you're talking about implementing it. How mm-hmm. do you integrate it into your life then after? So one of the things they taught us to do there was to journal Yeah. everything. Like you're going to write a lot and man, I've wrote a lot of stuff. A big part of it was like, write a letter to the person you feel like you're supposed to write a letter to. You don't send it to them, oh, but you okay. get it out. Then they had some coaching and all that, which I thought was just a really expensive upsell, <laughs> to be honest. So I didn't do it. Um, and maybe I should have. But, you know, if anything, that first experience and the subsequent experiences that I've had felt like it, it felt like my heart and my mind were two different parts of an engine. Mm. And those experiences were like the jumper cables that connected both of them to each other again. Mm. And I became more whole. Mm. Yeah. How do you decide whether you should do another journey and stuff? So this is super woo woo, but I just feel called to it or I don't like right now I have zero pull. I I feel nothing about it. I just did right now. We're recording this in what March I did one in November. That's five months ago. I feel zero pull to zero. Zero, zero. But leading up to November, like all of last year, I felt like I was supposed to do something. Yeah. And I didn't even chase it down. I didn't even call my friends. I didn't text anybody. I just felt like the right thing is going to reveal itself. Mm. And these two facilitators who I'd met, you know, I met the dude and, you know, a year earlier and it was just right. And that was it. But it was hard, man. It's you face some pretty crazy stuff. Like it's hard. Yeah. It's stressful. Um, you know, you do these things with friends, but then you got to face your demons alone. Ooh. Even marriage, like you get married together, but you get divorced alone. Like people don't understand that. Like that's a even in my career, I speak in front of a lot of people, sometimes thousands of people. Yeah. You speak to thousands of people, but you walk back to your hotel room alone. And that duality is like, it's like, it's disorienting. You're like, who am I? What am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing this stuff? Yeah. So yeah, there's that, man. I feel that too. Like sometimes when I do YouTube or like when I'm doing in the throes of my business, there's like, I'm like interacting with so many people throughout the day. And then uh, I go to bed like, dude, I'm alone. I, even when my ex was sleeping right next to me, I was like, Dude, I feel completely alone. It has very little to do with who you're with. Yeah. It's just learning to be with yourself. Um, yeah. You ever go into one of those like floating pods? The deprivation yeah. chamber? No, I haven't. So I did that once a couple, like five years ago. Yeah. Um, so like, it's just this weird looking egg thing for those <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. And it's this, I think it's like water with a ton of saline in it or something so that you yep. naturally float. float yeah. So the one I went to was in Seattle. You get in your own room, you shower there in the room and you just get into the pod. And then when you're ready, like someone comes in and they close the pod on you. Yeah. And it's just an hour. And you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty tall guy. Yeah. And I'm just like floating in this pod. There's nothing there. There's no sound. There's nothing. And I'm just like, I'm wiggling like this, okay? <laughs> like wiggling like this. And I felt like a fetus. I legit felt like a fetus in like my mom's womb. And it like, that's all I, and I was like, I can't think about anything. Like at first I was like, this is stupid. I'd rather get a massage. At least it'll relieve some stress. Yeah. And I'm just like, and this is pre psychedelic. So I wonder how it would be <laughs> if I did it now, knowing what I know now. Yeah. It was an interesting thing, just like one of those early lessons where I had to learn just to be present in the moment. Mm -hmm. And frankly, an hour passed a lot faster than I thought it would. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Like as you're talking about these experiences and you're talking about being called to certain things, what's happening on the outside of your life while you're internally feeling this? Nothing. Nothing? It just all stayed the same. But I think like, I think the bigger thing was like, 
learning that life life happens inside out not out so much so much of how we live life happens outside in so people tend to externalize happiness or fulfillment or joy or significance any of these things that we all want to feel to feel good right yeah we think if i find the right partner or if i make the right amount of money or the right status or the drive the right car it's all external stuff mm. And we're always trying to get that external stuff in to make the inside feel better. Yeah. But if anything, I learned it's like it's it's really about having it go from inside out. Mm. And so eventually, yeah, when I when I tapped into that stuff, like were there radical shifts in my business or my bottom line? Not really. Mm. I did shift things in my business in the way that I worked and the way I spent my time. Yeah. That was a big thing. Yeah. But I think a lot of the inner work is a lot like working with a personal trainer for the first couple of months. You do all this work and nothing changes on the outside. And it's easy to give up. I've been working with my personal trainer for about six months. I don't feel any different on the outside. Yeah. But he's like, all these other little muscles that you don't even know exist are so weak. Like we have to get them right, or else you know you're gonna be like an old man and hunched over and everything. Yeah. Um, and I just trust that process because I know I'm stronger. Like, yeah. I can't bench 400 pounds or anything like that. I don't have the eagle lifting, mm-hmm. which to me is like driving a certain type of car or having a certain type of status where we attach our identity to those things. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. Yeah. It's just the internal narrative, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, doing the inner work is like working on your cholesterol mm. or your blood pressure. Nobody sees it. You don't look any different. Yeah. You don't even feel any different. Yeah. But you're doing the work. Man, when, because we talk about psychedelics a lot. I think the first time I like met you, I was like, whoa, Mike does like a crap. <laughs> like he's like really into this stuff. So what would you recommend for someone who's like, kind of interested into the stuff would you recommend it for someone who's going through a transition or waiting for them to be called upon i got into it not knowing anything i sometimes don't even know if i'm saying the words right for the longest time i was like (laughs) cybacillin right i literally didn't know and for me in that sense ignorance was bliss because i knew that i was with people i could trust so that was big yeah i just trusted these friends of mine Mm. um and when I've told a couple of people who have been through some pretty hard stuff to consider it, yeah. and I can hook them up, yeah. they automatically want to know more about it. Yeah. They're trying to get a lay of the land. Yeah. And that's one thing, whether by ignorance or intention, I did not do. Mm. And I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. Because you can paint yourself into a narrative of what's going to happen. Yeah. If you set these expectations, you actually close your openness to what can what it can do. Yeah. Um, people have told me about ayahuasca. It's kind of going into more of the mainstream now i literally don't want to know what happens like they've told me like you gotta puke i'm like i don't need to know that like if it happens it happens big deal like yeah i'm sort of like i die i die yeah okay at least i'll go out in a blaze of glory and wanting to know (laughs) i didn't no one's gonna die yeah okay but if you feel called to it the only thing i could say is just stay open to it ask around Mm. and it will just sort of reveal itself the right path forward it sounds very woo woo yeah i'm not super woo woo maybe i'm woo woo adjacent (laughs) you know um but that's how it's felt and if anything i can look back on all of those experiences and again it felt like it connected my brain back to my heart Heart. like those jumper cables Mm -hmm. were reconnected and if anything i live much more intuitively now Mm. trusting my own feelings my gut my heart and I'm a very logical guy, so that yeah. was hard to do. But yeah, that's kind of what the end result has been. Have you seen like, this is probably gonna be one of the last questions. Have you seen like people do like psychedelics or anything like that, or go on these like, kind of like these guided journeys, right? And have you seen it affect like people's branding at all where they're just like, oh my God, I'm in the wrong direction. I need yeah. to repeat totally. it. Yeah, totally. Um, for some it's extreme. Yeah. Right now, Aaron Rodgers, very famous football player, mm-hmm. talked very openly about a psychedelic journey he went on last year, and he said it helped him love himself and yeah. you know really realize what matters and doesn't. And yeah. he's like this famous football player. I think he just got pr- back from like a three or four day darkness retreat. He was just in darkness for three or four days, yeah. and it became this whole stupid story in like the world of sports media. 
Yeah. And that's the only way I can describe it is like when you go into those places and you have those experiences, mm-hmm. you realize like none of this other stuff is really what we think it is. Mm. When that guy's 80 years old, what, what, what's it matter if he plays another year to a football or not? Yeah. He's 30, what, seven, 38. Like he's done all these things and he's questioning whether this was, I, I, I don't know what he's questioning, but he's clearly hungry and searching for more. Mm. Maybe he just decides I'm going to quit football. Who cares? It's his life none of like you said like you know you play in front of all these thousands of people every week but you go home alone yeah so why are we going to give someone crap about who they are and and what they do for the rest of us when none of us want that responsibility either Mm. let him live his life let him find peace and contentment with just just along the lines of everybody else you know none of us have it all figured out we're just trying to navigate this thing called life. As far as we know, we're on this spinning rock that's floating through space in the middle of nowhere. And like, that's all we know right now in humanity. That's all we know. And it's just (laughs) like, why are we so concerned about what people think and what we do and just enjoy this? Like, dude, you and I could be living in and no slam on them, but like some really struggling third world country and not have any water. Yeah. We're sitting in the lobby of a Vegas hotel talking about this, right? It's talking about these things is a luxury afforded to very few people in this world. So I'm very grateful, you know, you're sitting listening to this or watching this on a device that's streaming it over this thing called the internet. It's like magic. (sighs) Okay. And it's just enjoy where you're at, take it all in, be thankful that we are where we are. I know life can be hard and I, I didn't have an easy life growing up either. Neither did you, Mm -hmm. but we're here now, aren't we? So just find your peace and work for it. Yeah. As I like my last note here is like, as I'm thinking about this and I'm like closing my eyes and I'm thinking about like that Kevin version of Kevin trying to figure out what the he wants to do with his life getting out of pharmacy i felt this pressure to like build this business get out of pharmacy seeking it externally but i love what you said about internal out and um it just after talking to you it just feels like man maybe i should just relax a lot more because we all die at the end of the day it's impermanent yeah (laughs) it's totally impermanent my if i have kids like i hope i do by the way like that's one thing i want (laughs) okay at least you're clear on that. <laughs> if, if I have kids, I, I'll remember that. My my grandkids probably will remember my name. So It's kind of humbling. Yeah. 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 Cool, Mike. Thank you so much. My I pleasure, I really, dude. really appreciate you coming on here, talking about psychedelics and all <laughs> that sort of stuff. Um, there's just so many people who um, really would resonate with your story and stuff. And you're, you're just such a... You just have so much wisdom. You know, like that old man was, you got, you, you got that, right? Like, so, yeah. So make sure to follow Mike. Leave all his uh, links below. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.